Hey, how's it going? I want to talk to you today about imposter syndrome because I'm seeing folks talking about it. I'm seeing it come up on social media. People are actually asking me, hey, how do I deal with this? Um, and I want to make a video to really try to find the best way for you to empower yourself as a creative person to move forward. So whether you're a poet, whether you're a painter, whether you're an actor, I think we can all agree this is a common problem for creative people and let's figure out the best way to address and solve the issue. Now, taking a step back, this is not the channel of a psychologist. I'm not a shrink and I don't have that training. So if you need help and you're struggling with something, you need to get professional assistance, which I can't provide. Similarly, if you want the expertise of a psychologist, you're not going to get that here. So I recommend you go ahead and you power off the video right now if that's what you're looking for. But if you want help as a creative person, let's do this. All right. So I know that uh, I'm not a shrink. But I do also know that if you look up imposter syndrome in the DSM, which is the manual shrinks use when they're looking for possible diagnoses, you're not going to find it. That doesn't mean it's not a real issue. It just means it's not something like depression. It's not something like schizophrenia. Um, it's a different type of issue. It's more of a cognitive type of thing or perhaps something that people discuss and frame their own struggles around. Now, when I Googled about it, it seems like it's big conversation among celebrities. And I was surprised to find that the actor Tom Hanks has struggled with this in his career, which is super surprising because, you know, <laughs> Steven Spielberg puts him in movies. So it's like, well, how does that work? I took a step back and I thought about it and I realized, well, actors are a really great example for us because actors, their job is to manufacture emotions for their audience. And they do that in front of a camera or they do that um, on the stage. And they, their job is to convince us that things that, they're fe that they appear to be feeling are real. Now, whether they feel those things themselves is something... Uh, you know, uh, beyond my expertise, I think great actors really do feel the things that they are trying to evince. And that's part of the technique. But at the end of the day, it's a manufactured feeling. We can all agree um, when uh, Tom Hanks is stranded on a desert island in the movie, he's not really stranded on a desert island. He's making us believe that that's something that's happening. This goes way, way back to the origins of drama and this kind of catharsis that all great art can give us, this feeling of kind of emotional crisis and then uh, recovery. It goes back to Greek drama because they wore these masks over their faces. The actors, when they appeared on stage in these masks, the Greek word for them is persona. And then that's handed down into our psychological discourse today of a persona as a, t a type of public face that we put on or we share in the world. Uh, similarly, poets were at the scene of the crime here with the genesis of theater. Um, and we, we were uh, also have a similar job to actors in that we want to convince people of our emotions and truths in a form of writing that is not the same as a uh, nonfiction essay or an opinion piece. We are using the tools of emotions and imagery and things like that, uh, and of, of music to convince people of truths um, that um, are indirect. Uh, they're not factual truths, they're, they're truths about the nature of art and, and feeling and human relationships. They're valuable, um, but they're more akin to the type of truths we experience in theater than the type of truths we experience in math class. Um, also, musicians are in the same category, I would say. Um, so uh, if you are familiar with your Plato, you know that in, that in Plato's Republic, he singled out the poets as the special problem 
um, where he would like to get rid of them because of this ability to deceive. And it sounds sort of quaint today, but if you think about it really, um, it is amazing to think of a philosopher considering the implications of what poetry could do and saying that this could potentially be a threat. And indeed, if you look at dictatorships, it often is the poets who are being rounded up and thrown in the gulag. So returning to the Tom Hanks issue, which is what we're here to discuss, we're going to say we have this, this guy. He's paid big bucks to appear in movies. Uh, critically, you might not like all of his movies. You might find him boring or whatever. Who knows? But generally, there's going to be this broad critical consensus among people who are students of theater who could say his real acting skill is here. But he felt about himself, he felt here. So that's kind of a head scratcher again, but I mean, he is again, at the end of the day, from Plato, the Plato perspective, he's paid to deceive. So it's understand, under, understandable um, when we pay someone these big bucks to get up there and, and essentially deceive us that he could feel on some level conflicted. Now, I don't know, you know, I'm not a shrink. Again, I'm just speculating that these types of problems are real and, and could arise. Um, and, you know, even if you're not paid the big bucks, you might, you might feel artificial or you, you might feel conflicted about what you're doing. Even if you're an off-off Broadway actor, um, you know, or poet who, um, you know, people haven't really heard of, you're not a household name in, in the poetry game, uh, you still might feel like, um, you know, I'm doing things, but I'm not, I'm not really sure whether I buy into this all the time. And there's times where I feel like I do and times that I don't. You can go all the way down to the kind of the true amateur level and people still might have these types of conflicted feelings that are kind of small town players um, or people who just do, do uh, make art um, or music in their free time um, for their friends and family. Uh, who still might have these feelings that it's like, well, am I an imposter for doing this? And it's at this point, I kind of want to take the time out and kind of differentiate here, right? So I feel like Tom Hanks with his imposter syndrome, there's like this very large, very measurable surface area of imposterdom there uh, or of this feeling of imposterdom that is truly very irrational. And as we move down and we get closer and closer to this amateur or low amateur status, this area, this surface area is shrinking, shrinking, shrinking of what the surface area of the imposter syndrome is. And it gets down to some place that's pretty objective. Now, you could say that the top bar is his real skill and then the low bar is his feel skill, right? And as these two get closer and closer together, I think this imposter syndrome starts to miss a lot of uh, explanatory power. And I feel like if we get down to people who are, you know, just getting into art and exploring art, learning about art and sharing, having, developing the courage to put themselves out there, which is very important that people learn to put themselves out there, get up on stage, um, go to the open mic, um, you know, um, share your share your painting with your friends and family, whatever it is that you're trying to do, your first submission, uh, wh wherever you're trying to get that courage to do, it's imposter syndrome, I'm not sure really describes your struggle that accurately, right? I think there's another issue. So if Tom Hanks had this discrepancy between his real and his feel, I think a lot of people starting out and learning, they don't really know which one is which. Right? They have these feelings about themselves and their potential. They feel like my art might be special and might be meaningful, but they don't know where that is on that scale. How high does that go? And they don't know the real yet because they haven't had enough input yet. And they haven't had enough opportunity to gain feedback and really develop their own taste and their own ability to analyze their work objectively, which gets to my next step right so folks who are developing their resources as artists need to learn how to unplug from the perceptions of others which has nothing to do with feeling like an imposter this is just a basic thing we as creative people need to take ownership of we need to be able to benchmark our work 
not completely objectively, but according to our own standards of what's important to us. So if I'm reading a poem of mine and I'm comparing it to the poetry of other people too much, it's not helping me. It'd be more productive for me to look at poetry to, that I've written last week or three months before or a year ago and start to compare there to my own production. Then I can start to establish, am I making the progress that I would like to make? And I think if you're making progress day on day, week on week, month on month, year on year, everything's going fine. You can relax. You can get back into your own skin and trust the process. Now, if you don't know, if you're looking at your stuff and you're like, I have no idea. I don't know if I'm making progress or not. I can't understand whether my work is good or not then I think you're a little bit, you've lost the plot a little bit. And that's the time where it's key for you to get help and input. You need to hire someone. If you're a musician, you need to hire a, um, a, a music teacher, okay? A, a vocal coach or whatever it is, a guitar teacher. And if you're an actor, you need to go and you need to, you need to take some acting classes and you need to be around other people so you can start to understand how you actually perform on stage. If you're a poet, you need to go to a workshop or you need to hire an editor or hire someone like me who can give you feedback on where you're at and how you're doing, right? I can be your poetry coach if that's the service that you need, but you need to take input and you need to start to be able to understand where your work is right now. Again, not completely objectively, but at least start to get some tangible idea so you can approach your own work, um, not from this kind of uh, fog of war effect, but to start to make day on day, week on week plans on how to improve. And I think this imposter syndrome stuff gets bandied about in a way that's counterproductive. I'm not saying you don't have the right to feel like an imposter at any level, and I'm saying that, that that's entirely possible, but I'm saying all creative people are anxious about whether they're any good or not, no matter where we're at. And I feel like this is a serious issue um, that has nothing to do with being an imposter. It's just the anxiety of having to, for a poet, look at a blank page and think, oh my gosh, what the hell am I doing? Or a painter looking at a blank canvas, how, how, what, how, how am I supposed to get started? Or an actor, I'm going to get out on stage in front of people? Oh my gosh, I don't know how I'm going to do that. And I think it's not productive to introduce this additional complexity of whether you're an imposter or not. Because so much of what we do is inherently to, for better or for worse, trying to manufacture or create feelings in other people. We're going to present, to a certain extent, a persona. And I think it's useful and productive for you to get comfortable with the idea that you're projecting yourself. This is part of the job. It's part of the skill set. Okay? And put this imposter syndrome stuff behind you and instead focus on how you can measure or at least assess where you're at and how best to move forward. That's the way you're going to have the most productive engagement with your discipline. Thank you so much. Hope this helped. Please subscribe if it does. Always trying to put out some fresh perspective and fresh content for you. Thanks for joining me.